Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. If you're in the back, I am not the same speaker from last night. I... <laughs> I had five people come up to me this morning and say, great talk last night. That was just great. By the third one, I just started saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is good to see my friend Bobby. We got to hang out this morning. And and it's great to see Bob and Linda uh, B. from uh, Minnesota, two of my favorite people in the world. You're in for a great treat tonight to listen to Bob. And, and Jim, thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I didn't get in till 1 a.m. last night. I, uh, got up yesterday morning at 5 a.m. in Covina. It's part of Los Angeles. Had to drive out to Palm Desert 100 miles. Nine hours later, I'm driving back 100 miles to the Ontario airport. Flew up here, rented a car, and drove across Highway 26 at, in the middle of the night. And I pulled into the, uh, Ocean View, where, uh, the hotel. And I've been at a few of the, these things, and I didn't ask any questions before I came, and I looked at the size of the hotel, and I figured the meeting was going to be at the hotel, and I thought, there will be about 100 people there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I was very wrong. What a great thing you have going on here. What a great thing you have going on. Okay. Oh. Anyway, the most important thing I can tell you about myself is that I'm an alcoholic. And the reason I believe I'm an alcoholic is really very simple. I have a really bizarre relationship with alcohol. That's uh, why I'm an alcoholic. uh, My bizarre relationship with alcohol is twofold. First part of my bizarre relationship with alcohol happens uh, when I drink it. A really bizarre thing happens that confused me my whole life. And uh, the book calls it an allergic reaction. They describe this allergic reaction as something called the phenomenon of craving. And the best way I can describe this thing they call the phenomenon of craving in my life is that when I drink booze, the more booze I drink, the thirstier I get. And it happens with nothing else, only booze. An example of that, they uh, they gave me some water up here to drink, actually way more water than I need. If I drink it all, I'm going to have to go t- to the bathroom while I'm talking to you. But... Uh, they gave me some water up here, and over the next hour that I'm talking with you, I'll probably drink half a bottle. I don't know if my mouth gets extra dry. I might finish the whole bottle of water. But when I finish a whole bottle of water, I promise you, I can absolutely guarantee you that I'm not going to go get a case of water and lock myself in the hotel room for the rest of the day. I'm not going to do that. It only happens with booze. But if that's the only thing that made me alcoholic is this bizarre physical thing that happens is this allergic reaction, if that was the only thing that made me alcoholic, well, then just say no would have wiped out alcoholism, wouldn't it? Early 80s, Nancy Reagan came out and said, just say no. I would have, and I imagine you would have gone, oh, no, and just gone on and lived a happy, successful life saying no. Hit myself a little hard there. But I have this other bizarre part of my uh, relationship with alcohol, and that happens when I'm not drinking it. And I seem to have, when I don't have any alcohol in my system, I seem to have a mind that will rationalize and justify my walk back to the next drink at all costs. And so what I have is I can't drink successfully because of uh, this physical thing that happens, and I cannot not drink successfully because of this mental thing that happens. So I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. The ultimate catch-22 of alcoholism. And I set this relationship up with alcohol uh, right from the get-go when I first started drinking. I, I started a lot later than a lot of people in AA. Uh, I was 11 when I started drinking. <laughs> and, uh, and it is kind of late. Down in L.A., I see 12-year-olds taking a two-year cake, and they got a one hell of a story going on. <laughs> but anyway... A typical morning in seventh grade for me would be, I, uh, we lived in Seattle. Actually, I grew up in Ballard. Uh, I, if I were in a... I figured if I brought that up in this end of the country, we'd know a, a few people. But a typical morning for me in seventh grade would be, in seventh grade, would be I'd show up early for school, not for study hall or anything, but to meet my new friends at the very edge of the school property, Loser's Corner. Every school's got a Loser's Corner. It's about 10 feet off the school property. You'd be out there smoking cigarettes, trying to look cool, and there'd be about four or five of us that would be drinking what I like to call the playground cocktail. 
That's a jar full of whatever you could rip off out of the parents' liquor cabinet the night before. It's a pretty scary jar because nobody's been to bartending school yet. So there's uh, equal amounts of whiskey, vodka, cream de mint, vermouth, all in that jar. You can imagine five or six of us 12-year-olds choking that down <coughs> and handing it around. And of course, it was the early 70s, so we're smoking that commercial pot. Anybody remember that stuff? Four-finger lids, $10 a bag, seeds and stems and the whole bit. It was even before Ziploc days when it would just be a regular glad bag. And as you'd roll it up, there'd be about nine people spit on it like, oh, man. <laughs> we pack all those seeds and stems and leaves into a homemade pipe, maybe made out of plumbing fittings and a screen. Or if we were really desperate that morning, it would be a toilet paper roll with aluminum foil and pinholes in it. <laughs> were you guys there, too? Now, it's at this point that many people that speak in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous often interrupt themselves and they say something lit, like this. I don't mean to offend anybody, but drugs are part of my story. And I totally understand and respect what they're trying to do. They're trying to protect singleness of purpose, vitally important uh, aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous. But that aside, I still think it's a very bizarre practice for alcoholics to apologize to other alcoholics for doing drugs while drinking or in between drunks. I, uh, <laughs> see, I, uh, I understand. I understand apologizing to police officers and judges and maybe somebody who still loves us, but I don't know why we apologize to each other. In fact, the most bizarre example I've ever seen of that, I was in this speaker meeting down in L.A. a number of years ago, and the speaker that night was, was giving one of the most heinous, ugly, blow-by-blow drunkologues I've ever heard. And i got to tell you, when I'm in a speaker meeting and the drunkalog gets ugly, the uglier it gets, the more excited I get. And I think that night, that night I was on the edge of my chair drooling, looking up at the speaker going, yeah, 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 go, 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 go. <laughs> and at one point in this really ugly story, the speaker said, you know, I had four DUIs. And the judge said, if I get one more DUI, I'm going to prison for sure. Sure enough, two weeks later, I'm on the freeway in a blackout. I hit a family of four. They all wound, with, wound up in the hospital. I wound up in prison. In prison, I sodomized men. I was sodomizing. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I did some drugs, too. <clears throat> that thought that was strange that night. Everybody else, oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, by the time I'm 14 there in Seattle, I'm the neighborhood drunk, I'm the neighborhood drug dealer. I forgot to mention, but my father was a neighborhood Lutheran minister. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't laughing. Uh, my parents, really good, solid people in the community, and uh, the, it was no secret to them that I'm, I mean, I'm withering away right in front of their eyes. I mean, by the time I'm 14, my hair is getting long and down in front of my very bloodshot eyes and my vocabulary is, whoa, <laughs> wow. Right? And my parents tried to help. But you see, they didn't understand that their son was an alcoholic. They blamed my problems on people, places, and things. They always thought if we can get him away from that damn group of kids he's hanging out with, things will get better. If we can get him out of that damn public school system, things will get better. They tried all of the above. But you see, I'm an alcoholic. My problems are not based upon people, place, and things. My problems are based upon my physical and mental relationship to alcohol. You see, if you change the people, places, and things in somebody's life like mine, all that happens is that I'm loaded with different people in different places, ruining different things. That's all that happens. <laughs> By the time I was uh, 17, maybe 18, I barely scraped out of the public school system there in Seattle, and uh, my parents decided that Seattle was the problem. We can get them out of Seattle, things will get better, so they sent me 300 miles away to uh, Washington State University. Uh, <laughs> and I, I spent three years there in Pullman, and in three years I got approximately uh, 10 credits. Um, at any given time, my grade point average matched my blood alcohol content is what was going on. <laughs> By the time I was 22, this uh, little story I'm about to tell you will let you know exactly where I stood with my family. Um, now, my father was Swedish. My mother is Icelandic. Surprise from Ballard, huh? <laughs> and uh, Now, I don't know whether this custom I'm about to tell you about is Scandinavian or whether it's Lutheran. I don't know. But at Christmas time, my parents wouldn't just send out Christmas cards to their friends and relatives. They would send out this big, long Christmas letter that said everything the family had been doing that year. 
And when I was about 22, I got a hold of one of these letters that had been sent out the previous Christmas, and as I read it, it let me know exactly where I stood with my family. Now, the first paragraph talked about what my parents had been doing that year. Another impressive year, I'm sure. Second paragraph talked about what the Morris children had been doing that year, and that, went, that paragraph went something like this. Our oldest daughter, Christina, just graduated from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, with a master's degree in human resources. She's now working for a large pharmaceutical company in the Midwest. She traveled to Europe this summer. She saw this, she saw that. Her hobbies are this, this, and this. She's a very, very happy young woman, and we're very proud of her. Our oldest son, Eric, just graduated from Western Washington State University with a degree in marketing. He's now working for a large advertising firm here in downtown Seattle. He's engaged to be married to this wonderful woman named Mary Lou who works for a very small company here in Seattle named <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> it was small at one time. And uh, uh, they love to golf together. They, they love to travel together. He's a very happy young man. We're very proud of him. Our youngest son, Carl, just turned 22. About this same time, a drug deal went really, really badly, and so I joined the Navy. Um, <laughs> really tough night. What I'm about to tell you should scare the daylights out of you, but on my way into the Navy, I passed a potential test. It's called the ASVAP test, and this test qualified me to become a nuclear engineer. <laughs> that should scare the daylights out of you that the Navy was th even thinking maybe, possibly, or even remotely about putting somebody like me near anything nuclear. However, however, they made me take another test when I showed up at that base, and I could not pass that test. It's called a urinalysis test is what it's called. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was in the barracks. I'd been in boot camp maybe about... Uh, 10, 12 days maybe, and the Master of Arms came marching into the barracks, and he had a list of names. And I knew my name was going to be on that list. And about five or six of us were hauled out of the barracks and taken over to the administrative side of the Great Lakes base there outside Chicago. And in this van we were in, uh, the five or six of us, were they pulled up in front of this one building. The other four or five guys were taken out and put taken into this one administrative building. I was taken a few more blocks over to another administrative building and marked right into the commanding officer's office. The guy who ran the whole Great Lakes Naval Station. And I was marched right into his office. Big office, plush carpeting, pictures of naval vessels up there, big oak desk with this guy with lots of gold sitting on him, uh, sitting behind. And he asked me my name. I gave him my name. And he had this telephone on his desk that had this little speakerphone attachment to it. And he pressed the speakerphone button. And into this telephone, he said, Walt, my father's name. My father had been a reservist chaplain in the Pacific Northwest here for 40 years since World War II. This was an old World War II buddy of my father's. When he saw that I was from Seattle and the way they spelled my last name, he figured, put two and two together, and into this telephone he said, Walt, out of respect for our long-term friendship, I thought I'd give you a call and ask you how you felt about this situation, but your son is standing in front of me and he went positive on his first year analysis test. He was warned about this, and technically he should be discharged for a fraudulent enlistment. I wanted to ask you how you, what you feel we should do. Now, my father normally, his voice was big and powerful and passionate. But in, <laughs> but every once in a while, his voice would turn to this other voice that sounded like somebody had just kicked him in the stomach. And that voice for the, previous eight to ten years was the voice when he was dealing with me. And I heard that voice come across that speakerphone, and I heard him say a very simple statement, none of my concern anymore. Click, dial tone. I still remember standing there that day, and uh, if I could have just slithered out underneath that carpet out of that, out of that room, I would have. I, uh, I, I now know that I had been embarrassing my family in the north end of Seattle for, for years. And now I'm embarrassing my father on a national level uh, there as I stood in that office. And that man kept me in the Navy anyway, took away that nuclear status. They kept me in as a regular electrician, and a year and a half later, I'm a lower rank than when I first came in. I, uh, 
You know, it's like this. I mean, if I'm out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and I would look around and I'd see that I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a uniform on a gray ship. Uh, well, obviously, I'm in the U.S. Navy, no doubt about it. However, that ship would pull into a port and I would leave that ship and take a drink. And I would totally forget that I'm in the Navy. And I would come back to where I had last seen the ship when the drunk was over. And I don't know when that drunk is going to be over. I have no idea. And it's a very strange feeling being in a foreign country at, uh, you know, 6 a.m. and you're standing on this large pier and you're kind of going... <clears throat> you know, there was a destroyer here the other day. <laughs> Then thought would thought would cross my mind, how am I going to explain this to my superiors? And the second thought is, I can't even explain this to myself. So one morning, uh, we were, uh, I'd been drinking all weekend. I was driving into the, into the base, and there's a guard shack at the front of every Navy base where a Marine stands duty, and I'd been drinking all weekend. I had a bottle between my legs. My car is being held together by rubber bands, and and I was just trying to nurse enough in me on that Monday morning so I could survive, you know, uh, through that Monday morning. And uh, I guess there was a depth perception problem going on between my car and that guard shack. And all of a sudden, I remember my eyes focusing and I could see the Marine sticking his head out of that guard shack. I could see the whites of his eyes. I looked down. I'm still going like 35, 40 miles an hour. I tried to swerve. The car hit a median on the right-hand side and flipped over and bam, right through that guard shack. I can still see that Marine doing this big dive out of there. The Marine was all right. They were patching me up at the hospital, and they were reading new charges on me. And, and I remember thinking, new charges. I mean, that's just what happens in a guy's life like mine about every 90 days. Nothing significant about that. But the most significant thing that happened that morning is the Navy doctors prescribed antabuse for me. They sent this prescription back to the ship's doctor, and every morning before quarters, I would have to show up at sick bay, and the corpsman would put this little white pill on my tongue and make me sit there for a half an hour to make sure it ingested in my system. Over the next seven to ten days, I started to experience the most cunning, baffling, and powerful side of this disease called alcoholism, and that is that I had developed a mental obsession and spiritual malady so severe that no amount of discipline from the military, no amount of information from the Navy psychologists they were sending me to every ten days or so, no amount of love from anybody that may have still cared was going to overcome what I was facing. And I remember those next seven to ten days on that antabuse, I just slowly went insane. I remember counting those days on that antabuse just... Then four days, and <clears throat> I'm on antibodies. <sighs> now it's been six days, and <clears throat> I'm on antibodies. Now it's been eight days, six hours, and 15 minutes, and I'm on interviews. I started to look around that ship and uh, the other men, they're talking behind my back. All 300 of them. Have you ever felt that way in AA? <laughs> the only difference is that in AA, well, we are talking behind your back. <laughs> only with love and tolerance in Oregon, I'm sure. <laughs> On the 10th day, I just snapped. I went AWOL from my ship. I locked myself in a little hotel room in downtown San Diego, Plaza Hotel, 4th and Broadway. It was $13 a night. It's now $13.50 a night. <clears throat> I checked just a few months ago. I locked myself in this little hotel room with a bottle of vodka, and I uh, remember sitting on the, on the edge of the bed looking at the bottle of vodka and the shot glass on, uh, on this rickety little end table, and I, as I stared at the bottle of vodka, I remembered that the Navy doctors, when they prescribed the antibuse for me, had given me a very stern warning about drinking on top of antibuse. They had, to they had told me when they prescribed it, son, you need to understand that if you drink on top of this antibuse, you will get one of two reactions. One reaction is you will get violently ill. The other reaction is you might die. I remember looking at the bottle of vodka and I thought, well, I wonder which reaction I'm going to get. <clears throat> and I took one shot and nothing happened. 
authority had lied to me again as far as I was concerned. I waited about two minutes just to make sure. <laughs> and, and I took another shot. All of a sudden, I felt tingly in the face. So I, so I looked in this cracked little mirror that was in this hotel room, and I was bright red, blotchy and purple in places. Hmm. Took another shot. All of a sudden, I could, could feel my heart going... Boom, boom, boom. Looked at my shirt. I was drenched in sweat, and then all of a sudden, I was like... <gasps> hyperventilating. <gasps> We're doing all right so far. <laughs> I gotta tell you, this is a very sick group if you think this is funny. <laughs> In fact, I have proof of how sick you are. I'm gonna skip ahead a couple of years. Two years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and an honorable discharge out of the Navy, a <laughs> direct result of you guys. And uh, one of the amends that my first sponsor, uh, Bob W., and his sponsor were real sticklers about the amends step. And one of the amends that I had to make that I couldn't make in my first couple of years is that see, my parents had paid for that bachelor's degree. I either had to pay them back for it or go get what they had paid for. So that's what I did when I got out of the Navy, and that, that's how I wound up in Kavina. And uh, I took this business telecommunications bachelor's program, and in the first couple of semesters I had to take this uh, business presentation course. That uh, It's kind of like a speech class. In fact, it was. And in the first couple of days of the speech class, the instructor was randomly pointing at students, throwing them up in front of the room, giving them a topic to talk on at, just off the cuff, and everybody was supposed to talk for two to three minutes. The instructor was doing this just to see what he had to work with for the semester. And after about five or six students were thrown up there, the instructor pointed at me. I walked up to the front of the room, and from the back of the room, the instructor shouted out, talk about a bizarre situation in your life. <laughs> so I told him about drinking on top of van abuse. They did not respond the way you guys responded. They were like... There were, though, a couple of guys in the back going, Ooh, right on, right on. <laughs> so anyway, I'm back in the hotel room, red face, hyperventilating and sweating, and I take another shot. And up it came. My late sponsor, Eddie Cochran, calls this next thing to happen. You projectile regurgitation, just straight up and out. Thank God the Plaza Hotel is the type of hotel room where the toilet's in the same room as the bed. But I found the magic of drinking on top of Van Abuse that if I uh, would keep drinking and keep puking and keep drinking and keep puking for about an hour, hour and a half, enough of the Van would kick out of my system and I would quit throwing up. And I would just be left with red face, hyperventilating and sweating, and I already told you, I'm all right with that. <laughs> so, so if there is anybody that happens to be on Van Abuse, I want you to know you can drink on top of Van Abuse, but you have to get two things going on at the very same time to do this successfully. First thing you got to do is hang in there. You really got to hang in there, okay? And at the very same time, don't die. You can put those two things together, have at it. Drank on top of Anvius for the last seven months of my drinking. Uh, the, the only words are desperation drinking. There's no other way to describe that. The, uh, my second to my last drunk, I was left for dead in a motel parking lot in National City, California, it's the seediest part of San Diego, and, uh, and three guys just opened up my face. I, next thing I remember, I remember hearing sirens. I remember uh, a lot of blood. And then I, uh, next thing I remember, I came to, and there were uh, men and women with surgical masks and tools in their hands and bright lights. And you know when you come to and you sort of try to evaluate your surroundings as to what may have gone on the night before, it's, you know evidence of a really bad night when you come to and you see men and women in surgical masks with tools in their hands. One of those mornings. Uh, my last night of drinking, I was let out of the San Diego jail, being transferred from uh, civilian authorities back to the military authorities. I was being marched back up to my ship in handcuffs. And uh, the officer of the uh, day that day put his arm up as we were coming across the quarter deck and said, uh-uh, orders have already been processed on this loser. Orders are 90 days in the brig, bad conduct discharge, or treatment. Now, apparently some sort of options had been thrown on the table. I'm standing there in handcuffs. Lots of official people standing around me. And as that apparent, op those options were thrown out, uh, I don't remember thinking, boy, I'm at the end of my rope. I, I should take that uh, treatment option. I, I just can't, I can't go on anymore. I don't remember feeling or thinking that way. 
Nor do I remember thinking, you know what, if I just act like I want that treatment, then maybe I can beat this rap too. I remember thinking that. I don't, it really wouldn't have mattered when it boils down to it what I was thinking or feeling because I don't know about your experience in handcuffs, but my experience in handcuffs were always the same. Whoever had me in handcuffs never once, not once did they ever turn to me and say, so what's your opinion? <laughs> it, uh, it just never went that way in handcuffs. When you're in handcuffs, you go where they say. I, and I didn't know this for a while after I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I had always thought that handcuffs were just, I guess I just sort of thought that handcuffs were this minor and temporary inconvenience. I did not know the truth about handcuffs. I did not know that what handcuffs really are, are a symbol from the society that you live in where your society is saying to you, excuse me, we don't even trust you with your own hands. <laughs> I didn't know that. So uh, I was taken up to this treatment center, and the doors were locked behind me, and that's when the handcuffs were taken off me. And that's who I am without you. That's who I am without you. The doors locked behind me, and that's when the handcuffs can be taken off. Uh, everybody that showed up over the next few days, uh, we were about 35 of us, showed up from various ships, bases, and commands around, uh, around the country, and we were all going to do this 45-day treatment thing. Now, I didn't really know what treatment w was. I'd heard of it, and I guess. I, I don't know. But in the first few days... Paperwork had to follow us. There was no, like, advanced change of duty station here. It was just sort of, we showed up, paperwork followed. In the first few days, nobody's talking. They had assigned this facilitator to look out for us in the first couple of days and try to get us to, to talk, and he was just absolutely going crazy because everybody had their arms folded, looking to the ground, nobody's saying anything. And on about, you know, second or third day, this guy named Paco, who's from some other base, he raises his hand in this group therapy session and says, I'd like to say something, and this facilitator, I think he was new, got, yes, excellent. What would you like to say, Paco? And he said, well, I hear I'm supposed to be rigorously honest with you guys if I'm going to do this staying sober thing, and I want you guys to know that Paco's not my real name. Paco's just a street name I've used ever since I've been a young kid when I get into trouble, and this was trouble, And uh, but my paper, paperwork will be coming soon, And uh, I, but I want to get honest with you guys. My real name's Randy. Will you guys call me Randy from now on? Now, we all kind of looked up from the floor just enough to say, yeah, great, nice to meet you, Randy, whatever, and looked back down at the floor. But this facilitator got really excited and said, oh, my God, this is the first breakthrough of any honesty of any of you SOBs. Later that afternoon, Randy was paraded in front of us. They slapped a golden name tag on him that said Randy, and then we were all informed that whenever staff was not around, Randy's in charge. <laughs> I guess you get promoted pretty quickly in this treatment thing. On the seventh day in this place, they took us all to our first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Lisa was my first meeting. I had never been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no prior opinion as to what Alcoholics Anonymous was or was not. I knew there was such a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, but I hadn't really given it much thought. All I know is in the late afternoon, they told us to be in civilian clothes out in the parking lot, and five white vans pulled up. All of us were put into a different van, and those vans just went out into San Diego. Each, each, each van went to a different meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the van I was in, of course, pulled up at a meeting. We went, sat in the back, and... It must have been a participation meeting. I didn't know there were different types of meetings. All I know, I'm sitting in the back, and a few people got up and were reading, and then about 10 or 12 people got up one after the other to the front and talked for a couple of minutes each. And I don't really remember much of that meeting, but I do remember a couple of things. That as I listened to the readings and as I listened to those people, I got this feeling of, oh, my God, they know. They know. Now, if you could have seen me thinking and nudged me and said, <laughs> what is it that they know that you think you know? I would have said, I don't know, <laughs> but I just know that they know. <laughs> and what it was is that, I, indeed, I was identifying with the way you were describing your drinking. Absolutely. But that's not the thing that absolutely got me. What really got me is when you guys started to describe the way you felt when you weren't drinking. That absolutely nailed me. I had never... I mean, I'd been at the bar at 6 a.m. and a million times, but I'd never been sitting there next to some guy and said, I'm really soul sick this morning, aren't we, Joe? Right? <laughs> but I, uh, you know, you got me. And the next thing that I remember of that night is that one guy, this guy got called on and he got up and he said one sentence and he sat down. And in the 19 years that I have been here, I've never heard the alcoholic mind described better. This guy got up and said, my name's Jack, I'm an alcoholic. My mind would have killed my body a long time ago, except it needed it for transportation. 
And he sat down. He was like, I watched him all the way back to his chair. So in essence, I didn't know it, but you had me, but uh, I didn't know how I would stay with you, but I knew I needed to. I was at, I, I, that's what happened. I think it was an excellent meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that's the point of any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, to somehow hit that new person to know that they needed to be here. Now, it takes a long time for us to figure out how to stay here, but I knew that I needed to. Next night, we went to another meeting, and I got very confused at this meeting, because everybody at this meeting was talking about something called a drug of choice. People were getting up there saying, well, my drug of choice is. And somebody else said, well, my drug of choice is. And the more they said that, the more confused I got. I was sitting in the back thinking, oh, my God, was I supposed to be choosing out there? <laughs> do, do they want me to choose now? What are they talking about? So the next morning, I'm back at the treatment center. I asked the counselor who'd been assigned to us. Her name was Mary. I go, Mary, last night in the meeting, I got really confused. They were talking about something called a drug of choice. What on earth do they mean by that? And Mary's eyes perked up. She says, oh, let's play a game. Now, it's obvious that she wants to me to focus in on something, and that was very difficult because they still had me on anticonvulsant medications. If you've ever been on those, you know what I'm talking about. Everything's fine on a field of vision about like here. But there's dancy, squiggling things over here. And you're like, over here. And now they're over here. And you're like, it's hard to focus. Right? So if you're ever at a meeting and, you know, somebody new raises their hand and they still have the hospital bracelet, it looks like this. <laughs> and they're kind of shifty. You know what's going on. So anyway, I tried to focus. And Mary said, we'll figure out where your drug of choice is called. Imagine this. Imagine I walked into this room, Carl, and I had a tray. And on that tray, I had a bottle of Jack Daniels, an ounce of cocaine, and an ounce of tie sticks. Which one would you take? I started to drool immediately. It's, oh, 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 I take them all. And she started to snap her fingers. Settle down. Carl, I told you to focus. Listen. You can't have them all. You can only have one. Which one would you take? I thought for a second. I said, well... I guess I'd take the ounce of cocaine. She said, well, then maybe cocaine is your drug of choice. Do you understand now? I said, no. <laughs> she said, what's the problem? I said, well, Mary, the only reason I take the ounce of cocaine over the other two is, well, I'd take that ounce of cocaine, I'd get the hell out of this place, and I'd sell two eight balls. Now I'd have enough money to buy a quarter pound of tie sticks and a case of Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> now, the only reason I bring that up is to bring up a very important aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's sobriety days. If you're new, and no matter what you think your drug of choice is, there's only one sobriety day. You people that work with lots of people, I'm sure... Yeah, we don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> you, you guys that work with lots of new people, I'm sure you run across this scenario like I do at my home group every once in a while. I'll see some new guy around for a while, go up to him and say, hey, good to see you. How long do you got? And every once in a while, I get this response. Well, my drinking sobriety date is January 4th. My pot clean date is May 3rd. Oh, I blew my methamphetamine date last night. I was in Walmart all night long. <laughs> you need your car fixed? <laughs> One sobriety date. Funniest thing I ever heard about sobriety date, same scenario. Saw this guy around my home group for a while, went up to him and said, hey, good to see you. How long do you got now? And he said, well, I had 90 days, but I drank last night, so now I have 89 days. <laughs> I had to think about that one for a second. I was like... But I think that kind of falls into the same category as being down in Mexico, looking at the tequila going, would that affect my U.S. sobriety date? <laughs> yes. Yes, sobriety dates are also international if you're new. <laughs> so anyway, after 45 days in this place, they're going to let us all out. That's just what the orders were. And they're going to let us out on this Friday, on this Wednesday before this Friday. They gathered all 35 of us and they put us in this room. And there's a podium up front, much like this one. And biggest, meanest counselor in the place comes in and 
he's a Marine, and on this day he's wearing his full dress uniform. And a Marine in his full dress uniform is a very impressive and very intimidating sight. And I mean, he was wearing all his medals and everything. And he marched in and he grabbed both sides of this podium up front and stared us down. And we're all like, <gasps> it went silent in the room. And he didn't speak what seemed like forever. He just panned the room and stared each one, one of us down. Just looked across the room and we're all sitting there. Mm. And after he had stared every one of us down, he finally spoke. He said, you 35 have been through one of the finest treatment centers in the world for alcoholism and drug addiction, and this treatment center has been here for many, many years. And through the years, our statistics have shown us that out of you 35, only one of you will stay continuously sober from this day forward. Many of you will die, go insane, wind up in prison. Nice little exit pep talk, don't you think? <laughs> and he continued on. Many of you will relapse once, twice, maybe 20 times, and then make it back into long-term sobriety. But according to our statistics, only one of you will stay continuously sober from this day forward. And if you thought it was quiet in that room before, you could hear a pin drop now. The only thing you could hear was me going, Shit! Because <laughs> I knew if only one of us was going to make it, it was not going to be me. We all knew who it was going to be. It's going to be Randy over here, guaranteed. He's like the poster boy of the treatment center by now. <laughs> so on this Friday afternoon, they're letting us all out. People are picked up and taken back to their ships, bases, and commands in various different ways. But there were about four or five of us that had been arrested in vehicles the night before we were thrown in there, and I was one of those, and we had to wait for our vehicles to be brought out of this impound lot. When they brought out my vehicle, I was so successful when I was getting loaded that when they brought out my vehicle, they brought out my Rolls Canardly. That's the kind of car that rolls down one hill and Canardly make it up the next is what that is. <laughs> 68 Volkswagen hole in the floorboard, push start the thing. <laughs> anyway, we're standing on the front doorstep of the treatment center waiting for our cars to be brought out of impound. And one of the guys I'm standing with points at this, this other car coming across the parking lot. And he, he says, is that Randy in that car? We look a little closer and, yeah, that's Randy. He's drinking already, one of them said. Gee, there he is. He got himself a pint. He's just polishing it off. He rolls right in front of the treatment center, rolls down the window, throws the empty right at our feet. Crash! We look up, gives us all the finger, and drives right off. <laughs> I guess his name was Paco again. I don't know. <laughs> Next thing that I remember that day, I showed up at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous at the North Shore Llano Club in Pacific Beach. North end of San Diego, the only reason I remember that particular meeting hall is because it is on a hill. One of the tools for living when you have to push out your car is to look for places that are in an incline. And that's just where I remember that meeting was. It's cast in law in San Diego. It's a little bit of an incline, easy push, push start. And I'm sitting in the back of that meeting. The truth about my life at that moment is I'm 45 days without a drink or a drug. I got a lot of information, and I'm in the best physical condition I've been in since I've been a young teenager. But there had been no spiritual awakening, spiritual experience, even a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. It had not happened. It rarely does. That early on, I had information and I was feeling better. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. If there was ever a turning point in my life, it was right there in that meeting. Which, which way is my life going to go? One guy that night, operating in his primary purpose, looked over at me and said, Hey, never seen you here before. What are you doing? I didn't think quick enough to lie to him because I promise you I would have lied to him if I would have thought for one more second. <laughs> I didn't think and I just told him, well, I just got out of a Navy treatment center huh, three hours ago. You got me, buddy. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this guy's eyes went bing, big smile went across his face. I was like, what is he so excited about? <laughs> Did I pick the wrong end of town? What's going on here? I didn't know there were guys in AA that lurk around looking for new guys that don't know what they're doing. And this guy acted like he just landed a big marlin down in Cabo San Lucas. Woo! At the break, he's fighting his friends off. He's mine, he's mine, I got him, I got him. <laughs> now, other than the guy, this guy loving to work with new people, there was something else going on in this guy's life this particular weekend that made him especially glad to meet me. This guy's girlfriend had left him the night before for one of his friends in his home group. <laughs> so he's wondering what to do with his weekend, homicide, suicide, get loaded, or grab this newcomer. <laughs> he was all over me all weekend. We went to like 18 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
and this guy was insane, insane over this woman all weekend. I mean, just nuts. In between the meetings, he'd throw me in the passenger side of his car, and he'd start driving. He wouldn't even, and he'd start yelling at me. He didn't, he wouldn't even look at the road. He had like an AA radar car that just made it to the next meeting, right? <laughs> and, and he'd be driving, he'd be yelling, you gotta go to meetings, you gotta read the book, you gotta get a sponsor. Damn her! Gotta go to meetings, gotta read the book, damn her! <laughs> I didn't know it, but I was getting a very early introduction to your typical AA relationship breakup is what I was getting. <laughs> but I'm so glad that that guy that night, in his pain, was a guy in Alcoholics Anonymous who had done the work of Alcoholics Anonymous, who had taken the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and understood that the solution to his pain was out of self, out of self, out of self. I am so glad that that guy was not at home in his pain underneath his covers, whining into his sponsor's answer machine, she left, where are you, call me back, right? I'm sure he did check in with his sponsor, but he knew his solution was with me, not waiting for a magical answer from his sponsor. By going to so many meetings in the same area of town, I learned something really valuable about how we go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, especially when we're new. By going to so many meetings in the same area of town, I saw other people that were at multiple meetings over the weekend. Right? In that treatment center, they took us to a different end of San Diego, and San Diego County's big. I never saw any of the same people, nor did we get to interact with you. Right? We were in there 30 seconds before the meeting and right out of there afterwards. There's reasons for that. But I saw other people at multiple meetings, two, three meetings. Now, I didn't see anybody, anybody else doing 18 meetings, just me and that guy, right? But what I learned about how we go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to correlate it to a football game. I know it's kind of a sore spot in the Northwest right now, uh, football. <laughs> hey, I'm a big Seattle fan. I'm angry at Bobby is what the deal is. <laughs> <laughs> Best officiated game in history. <clears throat> Am I a sore loser? But anyway, a football team is out there on the field for one reason and one reason only, to win the game. And how do they win that game? They huddle up, they make a plan, and they do one play. And they huddle up again, make another plan, and they do one play. Well, that's exactly what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous in the game around here. Who's one day without a drink, you are a big winner. And how do we do that one day? We run in here and we huddle up. So remember, we're bodily and mentally different from our fellows. Break! We go out there and we try a little of this, try a little of that. And we run right back in here and we huddle up. And we go, remember, we're bodily and mentally different from our fellows. And just before we break some guy in the corner, I go, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. I've been here for six months. I'm sober, but I'm broken. I'm bored. What do I do? Somebody with a lot of time, like Bob, will get up and say, get a job, son. Break! And we go out there and we try a little of this, try a little of that. can be bad news for some of us. <laughs> so anyway, after this weekend, I get back to my ship, and the one other sober alcoholic on the ship, one other member of Alcoholics Anonymous, was waiting for me. His name was Bob W., who was 14 months sober, and I was going to be his first one. He had been working the steps with his sponsor. He was halfway through the steps himself, and by God, he was going to carry the message to me whether I wanted it or not. And he was just all over me and taking me to meetings and explaining Alcoholics Anonymous to me, checking in with me three times during the day. He'd pop his head in the work center and say, hey! And I'd go, yes? You all right? Well, I wasn't until you just jumped in here. <laughs> but he'd take me to meetings and he hounded me, you know, he kept on hounding me about the book and I avoided that part. I mean, I was going to meeting, 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 coffee, coffee, meeting, meeting, coffee, coffee, meetings, go to a dance, ha! Ah! Meetings, 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 coffee, coffee. <laughs> but you know what, during the next six months of doing that, while I was in the meeting, if you said something clever or insightful or funny, you would throw a Band-Aid on, on, a, on a hole in my gut that I didn't even understand, and I'd be okay for like 20 minutes. You know, I mean, I, I swear, the first time, little things you guys say in meetings, absolutely magical. The first time I heard, if you don't take the first drink, you can't get drunk. I swear, I paced out in front of that AA club for about a half an hour. Oh, my God. I mean, that was big news, life-changing news. That was it. I stayed sober like two days thinking about that. That was huge. 
But don't try to impress your loved ones with this type of information. I called up my mom like a day later, and I, you know, big walking on eggshell relationship for a long time with my parents. And I thought I'd impress my mom, and I said, Mom, you wouldn't believe what I heard in the meeting yesterday. They said if I don't take the first drink, I can't get drunk. There was silence on the other end of the line. <laughs> After a few seconds, the, she said, hmm, bunch of philosophers there in that AA program, huh? <laughs> but to me, it was huge news, life-changing news. But, you know, during that time while you th were, guys were throwing Band-Aids on my untreated alcoholism, you would find me in the middle of the night holding my gut going, oh, my God, it's back. What's the matter with me? God. I didn't understand that I was dying of untreated alcoholism right in the middle of alcoholics numb. And this man, Bob W., my first sponsor, who was, again, only 14 months ahead of me, saved my life. When our ship had to go out to sea for an extended period of time, he made me meet him in the aft end of the ship, way down in this little engine room, every night. And the first night, he tossed that book down on the table. He said, come on, I've been hounding you about it. Have you read it? And I said something like, well, sure. Yeah, there's something like how it works. Uh, we antagonist some doctor <laughs> with some opinion about something. If you would have cornered me, I couldn't have told you the difference between Dr. Bob, Dr. Silkworth, or Dr. Paul, for Christ's sake. And uh, he saved my life simply by, he was doing it simply to save his own sanity. I just talked to him yesterday. He lives in Portland now. He's still 14 months uh, longer than me. And uh, he was doing it just to save his own sanity. It was the most perfect, perfect, I don't even know uh, the right words to, to describe he, he was not doing it for anything else other than his own sobriety, and he understood that. And he, would, he opened up the book, and he started to read. And when he got tired, I would read. And he would ever so feebly try to explain to me what had been explained to him a couple of months before. He was no expert. I am so glad that somehow, whether he knew it or not, he understood that step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message. It does not say we perfectly. We practice a lot and, and get really good at carrying. No, it just says we tried ever so feebly. And he just tried to carry the message. And I mean, a couple of things were really, uh, in the beginning, he was explaining who these, you know, the book just makes casual reference to certain American businessmen. You know, they don't really explain who Abby is, who Roland Hazard is, who Dr. Silkworth is. And it's really important for me to understand a little bit, at least a little bit of the history of Alcoholics Anonymous to know why I have the privilege of sitting in here and how that came about. For me to sit here in Alcoholics Anonymous too long, and not understand at least the basics of AA history, you know, at least know who Roland Hazard is, Ebby Thatcher, and Dr. Silkworth, and what part they played. For me to sit here too long and not know that would be sort of like to be claiming to be a devout Christian, going to church three, four times a week, and then after a year go, Mary? Is there somebody named Mary involved in this? <laughs> right, it's just sort of silly, don't you think? But anyway, what he did was he tricked me out of his ignorance to have a lots of worksheets and all this type of stuff. He didn't even know about those. Out of the, that ignorance came the beautiful thing is that he tricked me into working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous simply by when the book actually said for us to do something, we closed the book and did it. Right? What happened to me in that short period of time was, a, was what the book describes as a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. I did not get the healing at the level of my soul that was going to be necessary for long-term sobriety and comfortable doing it until I did something else, until I ever so feebly tried to do what he had done for me. That's when the real healing at the level of my soul took place. That's when I started to sit in meetings. And yes, I really enjoyed those clever, funny, insightful things you were saying, but it was not like fixing me. I was feeling a real part of Alcoholics Anonymous and had a real hope. The other thing that I learned at that time was if I've found this solution, I have a responsibility to keep my seat in Alcoholics Anonymous because no one but us can help each other. There is no other p position in society that can carry a message of depth and weight and of the right type that can create the necessary change in the alcoholic for this to happen other than us. We can only help each other. How I learned that, I will never forget. 
my first sponsor, Bob W., and I would often split a hotel room when, when the ship would pull into port. This particular time, we were up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and we split a hotel room, and we went to the meeting uh, house, uh, meeting uh, clubhouse, and we went to the meeting, and after the meeting, uh, Bob said, yeah, I'm a little tired. I'm going to go back to the hotel room, and I stayed out with the AAers for a little while, and about an hour and a half later, I came back, walked in the hotel room, and there's Bob. He had found this guy named Blair, who's from our ship, found him on the street. Blair is wasted. Blair doesn't even know where he's at. Bob has him propped up against the headboard with pillows and an end table, and Bob is reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous to him. <laughs> now I'm thinking, this is silly. Blair won't even remember. You know, Blair can't understand it. I think it's kind of silly. I watched for a while and just kind of shook my head and threw a sentence in or two here or there. But I don't know, uh, Bob took Blair back to the ship, and that's the last I heard of that. And a couple of weeks later, we're back in port in San Diego. It's 3 a.m. I'm in my rack, and all of a sudden... Carl, wake up, wake up. Whoa, 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 what? And it's Bob. He goes, Blair's on the Coronado Bridge. We're going to get him. Apparently, over the last couple of weeks, Blair had tried to drink, tried not to drink, tried to drink, tried not to drink. I guess he was at the jumping off point. He's on the Coronado Bridge. <laughs> now, if you don't know about the Coronado Bridge down in San Diego, it is a really popular suicide spot. In fact, it's so popular that they actually have a suicide hotline phone at the top just in case you have a little change of heart. <laughs> and Blair had gotten onto that phone. And apparently this is what Blair was saying to the counselor on the other end. I will only talk to Bob W. <laughs> now this counselor is saying, who's Bob W.? And Blair was saying, it's anonymous. So they kept hammering at him a little bit, found out he was from the Navy and what ship he was from. So they called down to the quarter deck of our ship at 3 a.m. and asked, is there a Bob W. on that ship? Now, there's 300 men on that ship, but Bob, my first sponsor, he'd guard your anonymity, but he did not guard his own anonymity at the level of that ship so he could be of service at any time. So the guy answering the phone at 3 a.m. on duty said, oh, yeah, yeah, Mr. 12 Steps, we know all about him. So they went and they go and get Bob. Bob comes and gets me. Carl, wake up. Oh, okay. So we hop in Bob's car. We're going to drive down to the Coronado Bridge. As we're in the car, Bob said, grab the big book out of the glove box. Bone up on working with others. I'm like, okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> we get down to the base of the Coronado Bridge, and everything that San Diego County has available for a situation like this is there. The fire department's there. The police department is there. The on-duty psychologist is there. We walk up on this scene, and the fireman in charge looks over at us as we're walking up and goes, Is one of you Bob W.? <laughs> Bob goes, Yeah, that's me. He goes, We've been talking for an hour. He ain't budging. I don't know what you're going to do, but here. Hands him this little speakerphone contraption that was wired up there, and Bob grabs the phone and goes, Blair? You can hear on the other end. Bob, is that you? <laughs> Bob, Bob says, Yes, it's me, Blair. Now get the hell down from that bridge. And you hear, Okay. <laughs> one alcoholic can affect another alcoholic like no one else can. Don't forget that. Anyway, two years sober, get an honorable discharge out of the Navy, direct result of you guys, and you guys telling me how to show up and making amends and cleaning up my wreckage, and you know, I got out with, a, with a, the DD-214 saying I was an asset to the United States Navy. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I get out of the Navy and I uh, move up to, like I told you, to go to school, and I'm still push start in that same car. I had it for the first two and a half, three years of my sobriety. I'm puttering on up those Los Angeles freeways and you know, driving up to Cabina, don't even know where I'm going to live. Everything I own is in there, and I'm two years sober, and I'm thinking, I need a life. I really need a life. By God, I'm two years sober. Some guy blazes by me in a nice car, honks at me like I'm like a menace on the road. Oh, God! And I start thinking, you know what? I'm going to have to go to school. I'm going to have to work in between. I'll find out where the meetings are in my area, and I'll stop by when I get a chance, but i got to get a life. And once I get a life, I'll spend more time in AA. I'm about ready to make a fatal decision. And I 
pull into this meeting hall in Covina, 502 Club, they call it, at a noon meeting. And this man making coffee with this medallion that said 1951, making coffee at that noon meeting. And he did exactly the same thing that that man did at my first meeting out of treatment, recognized that he didn't know me, came up and said, hey, never seen you here before. What's up? And I said, sir, good to see you. I'm glad to see where this meeting hall is. But you know what? I got to go to school. I got to, I got to, I, I'm going to have to work. Um, I'll stop by when I get a chance, but I, I really need to get my life in order here. And uh, he just chuckled. His name was Eddie Cochran, one of the pioneers of Southern California AA. Most beautiful man I ever met. And he, uh, he just sort of chuckled in the way that he did. He said, ah, school and work. Wonderful. That's wonderful. But that's what we do in between meetings, son. <laughs> What he was giving me is the secret to long-term sobriety comfortably, and that is that I need to live in Alcoholics Anonymous and visit the world. Instead of trying to hack it out there in the world and visit Alcoholics Anonymous when convenient or when desperate, it does not work. See, AA will give you a life. Do not let your life get in the way of AA. It doesn't work. First thing Eddie told me I need to do was put new people in that car. They're like, Eddie, there's a hole in the floorboard. I have to push start this thing. One of them might fall through the floor. And then I looked at the medallion again and realized, you know what? He was 10 years sober when I was born, for crying out loud. I'll give it a try. And the very first night I did that, put the new guys in my car, I realized that this man had not lied to me. My life had gotten better. I remember that night looking over my shoulder and my life had gotten better. The new guys were pushed start in my car. <laughs> he didn't say how much better, he just said better. <laughs> oh, I can sum up a lot of it in this little story. A few years ago, I had to go down to Nogales, Arizona for a, for a little camp out type conference and called my mom to say, hey, my cell phone might not be working in the Nogales area, so if you call, don't, uh, don't get worried. She, oh, 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 you have to get a hold of Don and Leona. You absolutely have to get a hold of Don and Leona. I had to ask her to remind her who, remind me, Mom. And she reminded me, oh, I hadn't seen him since I was like nine years old. Don had been the best man at my parents' wedding and, uh, you know, lifelong friends, but I hadn't seen him since I was nine. So I called up Don and I go, Don, this is Carl Morris. I'm going to be in uh, the area there. Uh, love to get together for, for, uh, for lunch or something. And he said, oh, Carl, I, I know you're a absolute avid golfer. Bring your clubs. Now, that's magical words for me. I'm like a golf whore. I will golf with anybody at any time for any reason. I don't even need to know your name. I will golf with you. <laughs> I brought my clubs, and on that Saturday afternoon, I left the conference and went up, and, and uh, we we're walking along his, his, his course there, and he's like 70 years old and puttering along, and He's one of these guys that will just take your pocket change in a heartbeat, 150 yards perfectly down the center every shot. All right? Me, I'm knocking in the trees and water. Anyway, so the more we talked, the more confused I got because he was asking me very specific, pertinent questions about, he knew all about my life. And I hadn't seen him since I was nine. And I mean, he knew everything. He knew what school I had graduated from, what my bachelor's degree was, what companies I'd been with, the recovery homes I'm involved with. I mean, just, he knew everything about my life. By the fourth hole, I said, Don, I'm really confused. I, I've tried to squeeze a question in here on the side of what you retired from and trying to get to know you a little bit, but you seem to know all about my life. How on earth, how on earth do you know that? And he said, well, two reasons, Don. First reason is before your father passed away in 1996, he was always talking about your life. He was always so proud of what you were doing in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, that wasn't uh, news to me. My father and I, as a result of what you guys taught me how to do, had completely amended our relationship. And, uh, you know, I do have to say this on my part. It may not be in your situation, but had I not been able to reestablish my relationship with my father before he passed away, had I neglected that, I would have been walking around on this planet for the rest of my life as half a man. This is true in my life. But it was nice, so it wasn't news, but it was nice to hear from an old family friend. It really was. But the second thing he said, I couldn't even swing the golf club afterwards. He said, Besides, every year I get the Christmas letter. I'm like, yes! Finally I got in that thing! Jesus!
<laughs> I remained single in Alcoholics Anonymous for 17 years, and two and a half years ago, a woman walked in my office that I kind of, I knew who she was kind of, but she was far too beautiful for me to ever ask her out, and she walked in my office and asked me out. And we fell in love, and I put a ring on her finger, and boy, oh boy, I swear, putting we were pregnant like that. And I have to say, I'm pretty damn proud of that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 44 years old, and that was good news. And I got to tell you, I have experienced in the last 20 months since Madison was born. I mean, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love my work. I love playing golf. It really is. I have a passion for that. But this thing of being a father has become the most magical thing I have ever experienced in my life. And I did not know that this was available for a man like me. When she looks at me, and, and she's just squeaking out these little words now, I can barely stand it. That's why I didn't even mention this before, because it's really bad when the speaker starts crying at the beginning. It's bad enough at the end. But, and if you want to see pictures, I got them all. Bob and Linda, the first thing I did, I was whipping them out. Yeah, look, look. But you guys gave me this. So whatever you ask me to do, how can I say no? Because it all stems from you. You guys have a great thing going on here. Look out for each other. Find that new person. Make sure they are, they are hooked up this weekend. Don't let them drift out the sides. It's very easy to feel very alone in a giant crowd like this. Have a great weekend. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.